I'll start recording. Okay, you can share your screen now and you can start whenever you are ready. All right, hello everyone, uh, I'm Emily. So let's jump right into it. I'm in studio two, so my project consisted of designing a boathouse and community centered at Spotford Lake in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. And I am analyzing the office building here shown with the arrow. Uh, it's only one floor. And here are the section and details, some elevations, some more elevations. And here's how my building sits on the sloping site. I've incorporated uh, quite a bit of glass in my design. Uh, as you can see, almost half of the north wall is glass. Um, maximum, hang on, sorry. Maximum temperature in summer is 97 degrees Fahrenheit, and the minimum winter temperature is negative two degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, current, uh, the current thermal loads in the wall in winter and summer are 5,191 BTUs per hour and negative 1,946 BTUs per hour. By doubling the insulation and going passive, I nearly reduced my thermal loads in half. By adding more insulation in the floors, I also reduced the loads, but not quite in half. Current thermal loads are 8,807 BTUs in winter and negative 3,302 BTUs per hour in summer. The current windows are double glazing. Uh, going triple glaze reduced the amount of uh, load in both seasons, more than half actually. Ventilation load without heat recovery uh, is reduced more than half with the recovery system. Here is the total current thermal loads in winter and summer and the total passive thermal loads in winter and summer. This chart shows the solar heat gains through the windows on each elevation. Um, just uh, one thing to notice, though probably not too surprising, is that the heat gains are much higher in the summer months. Total electrical consumption is 5,687 uh, kilowatt hours per year. On my roof, I can fit 213 panels uh, connected to the grid. Here is the passive energy monthly consumption chart. Uh, one thing I noticed is that by increasing the insulation, it not only reduced thermal loads, but helped maintain a steady thermal load throughout the year. My total energy demand is just over 87,000 kilowatts per year but my panels only produce 46,000 kilowatts per year. This means I need to uh, increase my DC system size if I want to achieve a zero energy building. From going uh, 39.5 kilowatts to 90 kilowatts, I'm essentially doubling my number of panels to 487. These panels can be placed on the grassy area and the smaller roof. Here I'm just showing the area for the extra panels, the little black rectangles. Uh, this is uh, my diagram that illustrates some of the sustainable design strategies, like uh, natural ventilation occurs through the lower level windows and upper level motorized windows. Natural light uh, helps reduce electricity use. The uh, floor is continuously insulated and a good portion of the glass is on the north facing wall, which uh, provides diffused light without solar heat gains. Okay. And that's it. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> uh, can you go back to the first slides uh, where you can show, uh, yeah, show me the, yeah, the, the, these views of the 3D views of the building? Okay, so you mentioned that you have a lot of the uh, north glass area, and uh, well, it makes sense that uh, if you're used a uh, triple glazing, uh, you reduce. Can you show me now the summary of the cooling and heating loads? 
uh, yeah, the, those graphics. Yeah, you have uh, shown me this one and the, the previous one, slice number 20. Okay. Uh, I want to see the final number because it's like uh, 45,000, uh, the green bar, it's 45,000. Yes, it is. And then the, show me the number 21. And this is 18. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you have emphasized that you have uh, reduced the, uh, the thermal load through windows in half. But I think this is something remarkable that you should emphasize. Okay. So you are conscious that you need something because you have a lot of north window area. And uh, yeah, I think the, the most effective measure that you can take is uh, to use uh, triple glazing. There would be others uh, that maybe would recommend you use less north window area to save energy. And this is a struggle that we always have between architects and building scientists. Uh, I know, I, I suppose that there's a reason for you to use uh, such a big area in, in the north elevation uh, with the window area or the glass area. Uh, the aesthetics point of view or, or there mm -hmm. should be a reason for that. And you should be able to uh, defend that decision uh, against uh, some building scientists that might, might tell you, okay, so what if you reduce the north window area? Mm. And this is what we, I mean, this is the, uh, the, the, the ultimate goal of this exercise is that we have to make decisions. We are architects and we are designing a building, so we are making decisions. But we need to know uh, that those decisions uh, come at a price. And we need to know at least that using uh, triple glazing, it's much better. Mm. Okay, probably this is not enough if you are a professional, but this is the first step towards uh, becoming a professional. Uh, we, need, uh, we need arguments to defend our decisions. Sometimes it's not easy. And sometimes we make our decisions because I feel like doing it. And don't be ashamed of uh, making decisions because you feel like, uh, okay, I, I like this. Uh, probably would be better if I had less area in the north elevation, but what the hell, I want to do it. But then you, you, should, uh, uh, you should find reasons to strengthen that decision, okay? It's, it's not uh, it's not easy. At least here you can uh, you can say that okay. But if I use triple glazing, that's fine. But I'm sure that there are other aspects that you can defend. Uh, the other thing is that okay, I I have increased the PV panels so that my building is a zero energy building. Uh, so being sustainable is not easy. It's not a, it, it's always tough, and we have to struggle with our clients. Uh, that they want to save money up front. Uh, yeah, so you can tell them that by using PV panels, you can reduce the electricity, the monthly electricity bill, and eventually in 10 years, you will save money. Yeah, but uh, it's not easy. I mean, uh, becoming a zero energy building architect, it's not easy. And sometimes you will, you will have to find more reasons uh, and sometimes triple blazing won't be enough. And then you, you will have to find other, other reasons to do it. I think the presentation is complete. I would have, um, can you show me the, the final slide? Yes, uh, real quick, I just wanna ask, could, I, could the um, north facing windows that provide diffused light without solar heat gains be part of the argument? Uh, that is part of the argument, but this is an argument in summer, not in winter. Okay, so in summer, you can say that having diffuse light in summer, uh, so this is natural light, and that's always a good decision. And you can always uh, use the argument of the, uh, this natural ventilation that having this uh, uh, opening here, if you open this in summer, if you open the north windows, the upper north windows in summer, it will enhance the natural ventilation thing. So there are more reasons you can, you can uh, but I don't know, depending, uh, you will have to uh, now to show this presentation to your, in, in your design two class. So when is the final presentation? Uh, next week? 
next week. Yeah, I'm sure it's next week because we are done next week. Uh, but I don't know, maybe uh, I, I'm sure that they will bring other architects or other people. And well, I have attended some of these critics and depending on who's uh, attending or who is uh, invited to, to attend your presentations, um, I have seen this uh, argument many times. Okay, why do you open? Uh, so make sure that you have this. So you are using triple glazing. You can enhance natural ventilation. You can provide natural or natural light, diffuse light in summer so that you reduce the electric lights. And even with all these uh, reasons, it might not be enough, okay? But uh, we have to be exposed to criticism and that's fine, okay? So don't think that if uh, someone is uh, criticizing these decisions, that you are doing something wrong or no, is that you need to find even stronger arguments to defend your position. And this is what we are, this is what we are doing, okay? But I think it's complete, the presentation. I would have, uh, I don't know, you have a 3D, uh, I, I like the idea of finalizing the presentation with the site plan. And here on the site plan, uh, you see the new PV array. Okay, that's fine. But uh, in addition, if you can include a final slide with a 3D view, um, that, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe a 3D view of the site plan, I don't know, something more appealing. I think the, the, the last slide is uh, fine, mm, but I think the that work deserves a better final slide. Okay, so I don't mean that this is bad, but uh, I think it can be better. And just for the presentation, if you're giving a presentation, do not uh, finalize your presentation with a blank, with a black screen, and that's it. And you have to summarize what you have done. Okay, so the final slide should be like a summary. It can be a graphic summary. So that's why I was uh, hoping like a nice 3D view of your project with uh, two or three bullet points. And this is the final slide. So the final slide is not uh, a black, or maybe the final slide is uh, something that's, that says, uh, thank you and your name on it, something like that. Okay, so, but do not finalize a presentation with a black screen and, and that's it. So this is just for, uh, it's not about the work, it's not about the course, it's about presentation itself. So make sure that your final slide, it's always something that you can keep on the screen uh, and you say, thank you for attending, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but don't do that with a black screen, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, so please, uh, uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. And who's next? Emily. Uh, Craig, uh, are you ready for the presentation or you want to postpone it until next Monday? I'm going to wait till next Monday. Yeah, because I, I don't think it's complete. I will give you my feedback about what you have so far. But uh, I think, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I agree with you. You you can wait until next Monday. Uh, Alan, the same. Do you want to give the presentation now or do you want to wait? Can I wait till Monday, please? Okay. Uh, again, because I, I didn't hear you. Uh, could I wait till Monday? Yeah, you can. Uh, right. Again, because I have seen your, I've gone over your presentation and I don't think it's complete. So I think you uh, watch the presentations today and then you can wait until next Monday. All right, thank you. Uh, Hannah, are you there? Yes. Okay, no, because I see that you sent me uh, this and I like it, I really like it, especially the, the 3D model, it, um, uh, you are not done with the presentation, but I think with uh, this site plan and this, uh, this is what I wanted to show. Okay, so I want to, this is the Trubeck house and this is the addition. So I think you are in a, in a good position. I will give you my feedback, my individual feedback, but I think this is the kind of uh, 
uh, yeah, this is what I want to see at the end of the presentation. Okay, so you have an original house and then you have the new addition with the new plants. Uh, Can you share yeah. your screen? Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing the screen. Now you see that screen? Yeah. Okay, so this is Hannah's uh, Truebex house. And I like this because you have a, a digital model here. You have the plans. I, I think it's good. I like this first floor plan. Uh, this is good for natural ventilation. I think you can have a lot of, uh, and I like this uh, 3D physical model because it's, uh, well, it's, you have added this volume to the original house and I think it goes well with it. Uh, the only thing I miss, it's a section. Uh, I think we need two sections to understand this project. So we need a section uh, in this direction. So I need to see the connection between the, the old and the new house. And then we need a, probably we will need a couple of sections, uh, at least one for, for through this volume and another one through the original house. Okay, but I need also a section like this because I see that on the first floor, there is no connection between the, the original house and the new one, but on the second floor, there is not a connection. Uh, well, I don't know if there's a reason for that and you have to, uh, to talk to your design instructor but uh, we should be able, because by looking at this, it seems that both volumes are connected, but looking at the plan, uh, they are not connected. Anyway, I will give you uh, some comments on what to do with this, but I think you can use uh, the south elevation. I think this is the south and this is the north, or this is the north. Yeah, I think, uh, you can work with this picture, like a bigger one. And then with this one. Okay, so I think this should be the the summary of your of your project. Uh, but now you have to include here uh, something. Uh, I will try to help you do this, but um, I need a section. Well, I need two sections: one through this volume and okay. another one through this volume and probably a third section in this direction. Okay, I have those. I can just upload them into okay. it. Okay, yeah, so uh, send those sections and, and email me with, this, with those sections, and I think uh, we can do something good with this. Okay, uh, Hannah, uh, Scott, are you ready? Yes. Okay, so I'll... Yeah, so this is the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's completed. So I'll give you. Okay, you can share the screen now. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the final analysis of the Wilson Trailer House um, in Salt Point, New York, originally designed by Marcel Brewer and built between 1949 and 1951. Um, because of the time it was built, there was not a lot of thought about insulation at the time or energy savings. So you'll see throughout that there's some pretty significant changes going from the original structure to the passive house. 
We'll go through some technical documents, some sketches, U values, thermal comparisons, energy saving strategies, and then the PV array options. This is a site view. Um, it is not the entire site because it's 10 acres and I wanted to give a feel for the roof. Um, so I zoomed in a little closer than, than the full site. And you can see pretty stark difference between winter and summer sun hours. And that is the annual wind. Um, later on, we'll go through the seasonal wind, which varies different. Quick look at our floor plans on the upper and lower levels of the original house, as well as elevations and sections of the original. Now here's what I'm talking about with the original, you got an inch and a half of insulation on the walls. So not really much of a consideration once you upgrade to passive house standards. Um, you're looking at an 87% reduction in peak winter loads from 11,000 down to 1400 BTU hours. Same with the lower walls. Um, you're going from almost 11,000 down to uh, the number of the beast and 94% uh, reduction. The basement, again, completely uninsulated originally, going to the maximum insulation, another significant savings going from 13 to 4,000 BTU hours. The roof, despite the lack of insulation, was still the, the best performance of the original house because of the three inches of uh, Kimsel, which is essentially asbestos laden uh, wool. And you're dropping down from 4,000 BTU to 1,000, going to the passive house standard. And so the windows, I assume double pane to begin, going to um, high performance triple pane. And as noted on the south, and you'll see later in the design um, why I did this, but for April through August, I assumed they were north windows because the porch is eight foot deep and those months do not see any direct sunlight. Um, but that upgrade did result in another almost uh, 6,000, a little over 6,000 BTU hours. I also looked at, initially looked at keeping double pane with a higher solar heat gain on those south windows, but because of the nature of the overhang, um, decided to go with triple pane for everything. So we went from a U of 0.45 to a U of 0.12 for all the windows. So here's our peak winter. Um, you can see from 95,000 to 19,000 BTU hours for the house um, with 90% of it being the walls and a total of 79% at peak in the winter. Uh, you can see over here, the minimum is zero degrees. Again, looking at peaks, but this time in summer where you have a maximum of uh, 95 degrees, we're dropping from 36,000 BTU down to 8,000. Again, the walls, the biggest factor at 90% and a total of 78% reduction in peak loads. This is just breaking it down um, by month with averages and color coded. You can see in the original home, ventilation typically is the highest room for improvement. And even after upgrading to the passive house, even though our numbers are far better, uh, ventilation continues to be, over the course of the year, the number one uh, energy taker. So some of the key takeaways is you're looking at a peak savings of 75,000 BTUs or 79% lower. Um, 28,000 in summer or 78% lower. And over the course of an entire year, uh, 187 million BTU, 75% uh, lower than the original house. Again, it's important, you know, this house was from 1951. Really, you're only gonna see these kind of numbers on anything that was 
not built or, or renovated before the 80s when insulation became more standardized and after the 70s energy crisis. So here's a look at the winter strategies. As you can see, um, this is where I decided to cut out April through August. I uh, used this um, section cut in SketchUp and changed the solar path. And there was absolutely no direct sun during those months. So I switched those out. Uh, this is just a visual representation of everything we've gone over though, as far as where the heat's coming in or going out. Uh, this is the wind pattern specifically for winter. You can see instead of this, this tends to dominate from the west and from the north. And um, one of the things I like about this particular solar path is it gives you the hours of day. So when I looked at solar heat gains, I used this as my calculation um, to really highlight the difference in solar heat gains. So coming in in the winter through these uh, through the windows, you've got 9,000 BTUs per hour. Whereas if you switch over to summer, um, you're down to 5,000 BTUs per hour. And again, you can see the sun with this, oh, oh, with this overhang is not directly going through creating um, a lot of heat going into the building. Pretty big shift in wind as well, which is good because most of it's coming from the south or the southwest. And this is where a lot of our ventilation is coming from. Looking at the energy demands, uh, if you break down the annual into an average for your heating and cooling, it's 1640 kilowatts a month, and then your appliances at 567 a month. So I looked at two options. One of them was putting maximizing the uh, roof area with PV panels, um, which had a DC system of 9.25 kilowatts um, when our total annual energy needs were 26,480. We were only producing 10,207 with that option. So we still had 16,000 that we needed to get from the local power supply company if we wanted to keep going. So then I looked at a different option where um, I went with uh, ground mounted moving panels. They were sunflower design. Each sunflower had eight panels for a total of 96 because there was 12 of them with a DC size of 17.76. Now with that same energy demand of 26, we were creating 28, leaving us uh, 1,740 kilowatt hours surplus that we could sell back to the energy company. And this is just a, a view of what that would look like on the site with the 12 sunflowers. And that is it, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. I think it's a, it's a quite good presentation. And well, graphics are quite good. And uh, I think you have explained well. And uh, well, I think you know what you're talking about. Just, uh, can you go back to the site plan at the beginning? Okay, so I like this and I, I really appreciate all the information that we have in this site plan. We have the north sign, we have the wind roses, we have the sun path, uh, we have shadows or this shaped area. I like this. The only thing I don't like is the, uh, this is the driveway or whatever is this. Okay, a driveway it's not the most important thing on this site plan. I know that you need a driveway and you, it's, maybe it's relevant that you have this path so that you can drive your car until this, but it shouldn't be that dark gray or black. Uh, so the if you close your eyes, not close your eyes, but if you try to uh, look at this, the first thing that catches the eye is the, the, the black thing, the black thing. So if this is the first thing that catches the eye, that should be the most important thing on this uh, drawing. 
and it's not. The most important thing is your house. Then what is the second most important thing? Probably the shadows, probably. Then the, the control lines or the trees or probably the driveway, but it's not the most important thing. So by looking at this, the first thing we notice is this black driveway. It shouldn't be black. That's the only, that's my point. Okay, so we need to convey the idea that there's a driveway, but uh, it hasn't, it doesn't have to be black. Okay, the most important thing is the house and the shape and then the rest of the things. So the driveway should be as important as the trees, no more than that. So if you don't have black trees, <laughs> you shouldn't have a black uh, driveway. Okay, so just uh, uh, fix this not for this course but for your final design presentation make sure that you don't you, you need a site plan for the and you can include the wind rows and the sun path and the shadows for the design presentation but make sure that you don't include this black uh, driveway okay okay yeah i originally had it as a dirt road because that's what it is mm -hmm. um but donna wanted everything in grayscale so I swapped it out quickly without really caring. I what, agree what she on, the, on the gray scale, but uh, yeah, gray, no, not black. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> use another uh, shade of gray for for the path, and it will get better. Believe me. Okay, thanks. But it's a good presentation and it's complete. So, uh, congratulations. Uh, next one, I will share the screen. So we have Scott, uh, Sarah, are you ready? Yeah, oh, <clears throat> sorry, yes. Okay, so I'll give you, where are you? Sarah, here. Okay, you can share the screen now. All right, so <clears throat> this is the Wolfson House by Michael Brewer, Brewer, and this is how I tried to make it a zero energy building. Um, this is my table of contents. It is 16 pages, not counting the title page in this slide. The beginning of my slide displays the Wolfson House and its floor plan, site plan, elevations, and some sections. The porch is oriented to the south, which has big windows for solar gain. It is a small house overall. This is the wind rows from January and June. Because the recommended website did not have the wind rows for places near South Point, I used this website instead. Looking at all the data from all the months, it is very unclear where the predominant wind is coming. I think it is the Northwest, but some would disagree and be right. The second uh, slide presents the calculations of the areas of roofs, walls, and windows. Uh, here we can see the U value as well as the thermal conductivity in the winter for the roof. We experimented, experimented with two inches of EPS, six inches of fiberglass, which was for the current, versus seven inches of fiberglass, seven inches of EPS, and three inches of air cavity for passive. As you can see from the highlighted numbers, there is a 761 BTU hour de decrease for the thermal load when adding more insulation. This this fourth slide, like the previous one, shows the walls with different amounts, different amounts of thermal insulation in winter. Here we are comparing six, six inches of fiberglass for the current and 11 inches for passive. Here there is a 1,458 BTU hour difference, which is very significant. Probably the biggest, uh, yes, probably the biggest change is what we see when we add insulation to the basement in the winter. There is a 20,412 BTU, BTU, BTU hour difference. As for the windows, when we upgrade to triple pane, there is a 5,746 BTU hour difference. As for the ventilation, adding 90% heat recovery can be the difference of 11,484 BTU hour difference. This slide can tell us uh, that changing amount of thermal insulation in the winter as well as summer can save a lot of a lot of thermal heat, a lot of a lot of thermal losses, which is good, as well as heat recovery for ventilation. 
These next two slides show the solar gain compared to the heat losses from each aspect of the building. This shows the heat gains compared to the heat losses from the current material being used versus the material from passive. You can clearly see that by adding more insulation to the basement and adding triple pane glass, I was able to decrease, decrease this load significantly. And this is the improvements or after. Um, so this is my overall um, diagram of the loads and ventilation and everything. And um, yeah. So now we're going to analyze the energy and power of the flat PV array versus the open rack. Um, here we first have to analyze the, what appliances we have and how much power it will take to, each, to run um, each of them each month. Now we will compare the PV panels and what array is more efficient for this building and provides the most energy. We have two options, a flat rack of panels covering the entire space of the Wilson house or an open rack with PV panels at a 40 degree incline facing the sun, but less of them. Analyzing this, I realized that a flat rack of PV panels would be more efficient than an open rack, although it costs significantly more, the energy provided by the panels would make up for the cost lost initially. Um, one of the last steps in is figuring out how many PV panels it would take to cover appliances as well as heating and cooling. Here we see three options that would allow me to have close to a zero energy building in the winter, but for sure in the summer. This called for 216 panels at a 40 degree, 40 degree incline facing the south. But I had to be more realistic, so I looked at the possible design principles and I incorporated them into PV pan. Um, yeah, incorporated them into PV panels. I ended up making an outdoor pavilion with a roof oriented to the south at 40 degree angle, so I could cover all the all of it with panels. I used the PV panels for shade in the summer on my addition. I also added vertical loose solar protection on the east side of my yoga studio. This last slide, oh, this last slide conveys that even though I did not have 216 panels all angled at 40, 40 degrees, I still had a yearly energy production which was higher than the yearly demand according to what appliances I was using, as well as the heating and cooling. Therefore, I conclude with selling the remaining energy in the summer or utilizing the extra energy to the Airbnb and yoga studio appliances. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think I told you that uh, for the final slide or for the final summary, uh, because I like this idea, I like this uh, sitting outdoor area for summer, and then you, yeah, you can have this open area for, and then you have this roof, and you can place the PV panels there. I think this is an idea, I, I don't know if you have used this idea for your design studio, or you only have used this idea for this course, uh, so did you show this to your uh, design the professors? No, um, I, I it was just for this class. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think it's a good idea. I mean, and I think the project will get better if we had seen these elements in the site plan. Okay. Okay. Uh, probably you might think that it's not a good idea in terms of design. And well, I don't know. Uh, we can debate that. But for this, uh, you have, because this is what we are looking for. We are looking for integration of renewable energies. We are looking for a new landscape ideas. So this is a way to introduce, is, this, is it the best way? I don't know. Is it uh, something that uh, um, improves the, the overall design of your, of your addition, the yoga studio and the Airbnb? In my opinion, it can improve it if you place those elements uh, with uh, uh, how you call it. Uh, I don't know if you use those elements for landscaping. Uh, you can improve it. And just placing uh, uh, one of these uh, seating areas somewhere, like okay, here and there and there. Maybe it doesn't make any sense, but if you find a good way to insert those places 
with an intention that makes, I don't know, maybe you can create like an area between those seating areas and the, the, the rest of the building, or you can relate this to the, to the trees. I don't know, I think it's a good idea. I think it's something that architects, uh, we have to, yeah, we have to create elements like this. It, it's not architecture. It's not, uh, it's not architecture, but that, because I mean, it's, it's something very small and it's just a sitting area. So it's not a building. This is what I want. It's architecture, but it's not a building. Um, but I think if you, I like the idea, but you have to make the most of it. It's not just, okay, I have this and I have the house and they are two separate elements. I think the secret to success is to find the relationship between this and that. If you are not doing this for your design course, that's fine. But if you were doing this for the design course, probably your design professors could help you with that. So it's up to you. But I think now there is something missing. So you have the house and you have integrated your PV panels on the roof and you have created overhangs with PV panels. That's a good decision. Then you have this element, this uh, landscape element uh, for the seating area. So that's another good decision, but you haven't connected these two good decisions, if you know what I mean. So now yeah. it's, it's like you have to separate the ideas and they are not connected yet. Okay. Uh, I don't mean that you have to do it. Uh, at least you have thought of something new. It's not just like an open rack uh, PV panels that you have placed uh, somewhere. You have tried to integrate PV panels on this, and that's good. You are too, you are young. Uh, but for next projects, for next design, uh, try to integrate this at the first stage of your design idea. Okay, so try to use this element as something that can make your project better. Not only you can include the the PV panels, but it's something that if if you if you try, you can make your project better just by integrating this or just by connecting this to the to the building. It's difficult. I know it's difficult. If this is not a design course, mm, but uh, next time in your next design course, try to think of something to integrate new renewable energies and try to make it part of your project since the beginning at the first stage of your design thinking process. Okay. Well, uh, I, we will, uh, I don't know, probably I will be your professor in some design course in the near future. And then we will, we will talk about this later. But I like the presentation. The only thing is that I think you, it, it can be, the project can be better if you connect these two, two ideas. But uh, okay. it's good enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, so who's next? Uh, Dorsa. Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, where are you? Here. Okay, share the screen, please. Okay, here is the, my project. It's about a boathouse facility in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. Here you can see the site plan with the roof boundaries, sun path, and the uh, windrows. First and second floor plans, four elevations of the building. Here are some renderings. Uh, so here is the wall details with the calculations of the U value. The same thing for the roof and for the floors. So this, this is the minimum and maximum temperature in Chesterfield throughout the year. Um, here is the calculations for thermal loads through the walls in current and passive house conditions. You can see how much it, it reduced. Thermal loads uh, through the roofs for both conditions, through the floors again for both conditions, 
uh, this is where I chose uh, my grass type. This is a uh, double pane was before, now it's a uh, triple pane. Ventilation loads for 40 people with and without the heat recovery. So this is the uh, total therm uh, thermal loads through the envelope of the building. Um, the maximum uh, used to be about 90,000 BTU per hour, but uh, it reduced to about 36,000 BTU per hour. Cooling loads in summer. Uh, so for the solar heat gains, I uh, use two different types of glass. I use one uh, that has a, that's a double pane for the south, but with a higher solar heat gain. But for the other sides, I uh, use a three pair, uh, three pane uh, glass with a lower U value. The total electricity demand of the building is about 7,000 kilowatt hour. So here is how I oriented my panels. I thought that if they are facing south, uh, that's going to be the best position for them. But because they were casting shadow on each other, I could only put 240 panels with a 40 degree tilt facing south, which gave me this much of energy. It was not enough. So I reoriented them. I put them flat on the roof. Uh, and the flat is, uh, and the roof itself has a 10 degree tilt toward the best, so I, uh, toward the west. So I could place uh, 571 panels and it gives me much more energy. So I went with this orientation. This is the yearly heating and cooling load summaries. You can see in October and May, the uh, heat gains are about the same as the heat losses. Uh, most of the energy consumption goes to, uh, to the ventilation and goes through the heat loss through the windows. So here is the panels are uh, covering some of the months, but still the energy production is less than the energy demand of the building. So I added this structure here at the entry point of the property. It emphasizes where the entrance is, it shows the boundary of the building, and also it makes a shaded place. And it gave me an opportunity to uh, place more panels on top of it. I could not place them on the ground level uh, because there are lots of trees around the uh, property and on the property, and they cast shadow on the ground. So I needed a higher place to put them. So I put 155 more panels that gave me 35,000 kilowatt hour more energy. I added these two energy productions and it's very close to the energy demand of the building. It covers about 98.5% of the total demand. So here's the summary of the stra uh, design strategies. There are PV panels on top of the roof. There is a overhang here that prevents the summer sun to heat up the building through this uh, glass here, but we can still gain summer uh, winter heat. We can still gain some heat uh, in winter. There is a mechanical a window here that can, we can open and use the natural ventilation. Also natural ventilation through here. There are heat recoveries here, and also use of uh, two different types of glasses help me to manage the solar heat gain and heat losses through the window. That was it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, show me this uh, section. I think this is a good summary. Uh, you have the everything, the PV panels, the it's a good thing that you have used, especially in these uh, large buildings, in small buildings, maybe it doesn't make sense, but in large buildings, using different windows for the south and for the north, I think it's good because in the north, uh, you have a triple glazing with a low U value. Mm -hmm. In the south, uh, probably the, the U value is not as relevant as the solar heat gain coefficient. Yes. So you have a 0.7 solar heat gain coefficient in the south and 0.2 in the north. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and I think in, in this kind of buildings, it's worth using different windows. Okay, so it's something that we usually don't uh, think about. You say, okay, what is the best window? The best window in, uh, in different orientations 
is uh, so the, the window that we have to use or the class we have to use in different orientations it should be different as well and i think you have understood that and that's uh, that's fine uh, then you have an unheated storage uh, well i haven't thought about i haven't talked about this and uh, it's here it can be better i think if you use this unheated storage uh, and you connect this to the heat recovery that it's there so you have the heat recovery there and uh -huh. uh, that would be um, yes yeah, somehow you have these arrows and uh, this blue arrow that you have in the heated storage and then it goes uh, and then it goes back again yeah so i think if you have connected these arrows to the heat recovery and then okay. from the heat recovery, we had a duct system. And why are we doing this? Uh, because having a, an, an unheated storage, uh, it's like a buffer space between the outdoor air and the indoor air. Okay, so we don't have a heating or a cooling system in this storage, but in winter, it won't be as cold as the outdoor. And in summer, it, it won't be as uh, hot as the outdoor air. So that's why uh, having the, the heat recovery connected to the unheated storage, it can be a basement or a storage, or it can be an attic. So having a space that it's not heated or cooled, it's good in buildings, especially in these large buildings, okay? Because your, your scale is different. You are not dealing with a single family house or a small building. Yes. You are dealing with something big. So that's why your heating loads are that big and you need such uh, how many panels do you need? 100 and how many panels? It's about 500. 500? Yes. A lot of them. Yeah, because uh, the heating and cooling loads are, are because this is a public building and yeah, public, public buildings are different. So I like the process uh, and you haven't shown uh, because sometime uh, a few weeks ago, you decided to change the original design. Yes. Uh, why was it? <laughs> um, well, I presented my midterm and there were so many problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, the roof shape was so big. It was so tall that it was not a good thing for this building. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, when we are uh, when we are presenting our semester work, um, I think it's like a story. Okay, so it's not just the final result. So this is my final result. The final result is not relevant. Well, it is relevant for sure, but it's relevant uh, because it's the part of a design thinking process. So showing uh, what you did before, you have to mention, you don't have to explain why you did this, but uh, showing the how the project has changed uh, because you have received different feedback from different people. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something uh, that matters when you are showing the, the final presentation. Uh, you have to be, because you have five, uh, six minutes to give your presentation about your design. So you can't uh, talk about uh, all the decisions that you have made. But if there's uh, something relevant that in your midterm, you have a tilted roof and now you have a flat roof, Probably you have to mention why, and even it's because of the feedback you have received. But then you internalize this, and you can make that feedback as a part of your decision-making process. I don't know; it's complicated to explain, but I think, um, especially if you are developing this project throughout the semester, mm -hmm. it's good having the first version, then the second version, then the final version. I think okay. it's good. Okay. Uh, and I think you are. Uh, show me the, the number 23, the slide number 23. Okay, so here you have added these landscape elements like the pergola to integrate. Okay, that's fine. This is something that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and can you show me the site plan at the beginning? Here. Okay, this is the site plan. Mm -hmm. uh, where is that pergola in this site plan? It's here. It's, oh, it's here, it's there. there. Uh, and then can you show me the 3D, uh, number six? 
So Thank you. Yes, there. Yes, uh, I I like it, and uh, I like how the project has changed. I think now the project is better than the first thing you showed me. Okay, good. <laughs> and uh, and there is some, there is only something I don't like it. Um, is this Revit or what is it? It's Revit. It's Revit. Okay, so never, never trust the default uh, textures that you have in Revit. Uh, so this green, green grass, uh, uh, we have to change it. Okay, well, we have. Uh, I think there are better options than, than this. Uh, Revit is not good at rendering. And you have to be careful because your renders can be much more appealing just by changing the textures or just by changing the strategy. Uh, if you use the default uh, grass that you have in Revit or the default uh, sky, it looks like, uh, so you have to learn how to do something special. Your project is special, is unique. So there is not another project like this in the, in the world. So these kind of projects deserve another kind of uh, skies or green textures. Yes, Because that's right. mm -hmm. everybody that is using Revit is going to work with the same green and the same sky. Yes. So if your project is unique, you have to find something unique uh, to show your, your project. Okay. This is not about uh, sustainable design or whatever, but it's just about the presentation. So I think you have time to present your final or to give your final presentation of design. Uh, try to work uh, with this because in, in design, uh, the colors, the texture, the, the materials we are using are relevant. Yes, and I will do that. They can be better. Okay. But I like it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So who's next? Uh, Slisha. Yeah. Okay, are you ready? I am. Okay, great. So let me. Uh, where are you? Yeah. Okay, I think you can share the screen now. Can you see it? I see. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, I am Salisha, and today I'll be presenting on the Wolves and House and the edition that I did for it. It is located in South Point, New York. Here is the content and the outer temperature that I got from the website that Fernando provided. Here are some elevations of the addition and the original house, the south elevation, north, east, and west. Here is the uh, plan and the section of the Wolfson, Wolfson house. And on the plan, you can see the sun path, uh, some trees, a driveways, and also the wind. Um, I couldn't find the windows for Wolfson house because it just did not have the station, but I got this from the Google map and the Google Earth. Uh, so the U value of the roof was found at the average was found out to be 0 0.01 by using the materials and the thickness um, that, are, that are provided over here. Um, while using, while having the layers, um, four of the layers inst insulated, this is the U values that um, was found. And the U value of the wall was found out to be 0 0.02. The U values of window was found um, by using this manual, double glazing being 0 0.45 and triple glazing being 0 0.18. The U average for the floor was found out to be 0 0.0233. So com comparing the thermal load of the wall just by bumping up the fiberglass from 11 inches to 16 inches, um, 
the U value was found out to be um, found was found to be decreased um, 0 0.02 to 0 0.01, and we can clearly see the thermal load being decreased. Um, comparing the thermal load of the uh, roof, uh, we can see that the uh, thermal load decreased from 2,135 to 1,820 BTU per hour. Here's the comparison of thermal load of basement. So what I did for basement is um, first only four layers were insulated. Then for the passive house, the entire layer was insulated and also the R, R value was bumped up. So nearly like um, a half of the, near to half of the thermal load of the basement was decreased. So here's a comparison of thermal load of windows. And I think this is, you can see enormous amount of thermal load being decreased, almost almost to more than half uh, from 22,000, just over 22,000 uh, BTU per hour to 8,833 BTU per hour. Um, here's the comparison of thermal load of ventilation when we use the heat recovery, when we did not use the heat recovery and using the heat recovery with a 90% of efficiency. Um, the total ventilation was um, 31,139 and it uh, got um, down to 12,500. So there's the comparison of thermal load um, of the current house, the normal house and the passive house throughout the year. And we can clearly see the difference. Here's the thermal load in summer for passive house. Uh, this is the solar heat gain throughout the year. Um, and this is uh, using the triple glazing. Um, here's the monthly electric demand um, for, I tried, to, I, I tried to do this for all the buildings, but I still know that there, um, there's gonna be so much more electrical appliances and I can add more, but this was just like an experiment. Um, the total uh, electrical demand was found out to be 504 kilowatts, per, um, kilowatts hour per uh, month. Uh, the area that was available for, so the actual area that was available for PV panels, if I were to put everything on the roof was 2000 feet square, but then I just did not like how it looked on the other roofs. Um, that's the reason I just planned on using it, uh, using the roof of the original house. So the area available was a 1,032 feet square. The number of PV panels that could fit over there is uh, 58 panels. And then um, that makes the DC system size to be 10.73 kilowatts. And the cost for it is uh, about $2,146. Um, here's the thermal load with respect to the outer temperature. And... Um, I am so, so glad that I used, um, um, that I included the uh, windows in the southeastern direction because um, now we can see that the solar heat gain is so much, it's like almost, it can actually compensate to the thermal load that the house is um, exerting. Um, over here, we can clearly see that the solar heat is so much way more than the thermal load. Here's the energy consumption. Um, and this is um, when um, I used about uh, 58 um, panels uh, with DC, DC system size of 10.73. The energy demand was uh, 30,156.74 uh, and energy production was just 14,066. So when I bumped it, bumped the, um, bumped up the size, uh, um, DC system size to 25, um, uh, the total panels that had to be used was 135 panels and the cost was about $5,000. But um, it is not like, it, it couldn't totally like um, cover all the energy consumptions. But I was thinking why not if we could use the energy that I produced over here and is going waste, if we can, we are able to save this into a battery and use this energy to compensate the energy that's been that's kind of like being consumed over here, which cannot be covered by the solar panels. It would be great. Some of the, I think there were four major design strategies that I took while doing this project. First being um, the addition of uh, windows in the southeastern direction. Most of the windows are faced south. Um, and the next would be addition of the louvers um, 
uh, as Fernando suggested me to do. I still don't know if I like how it looks in my design. So it is something I wanna still work in the future. Um, but my house was having a lot of issues with uh, summer heating. So I think louvers would definitely help me um, reduce um, that problem. Uh, the next would be use of the uh, panels. Um, this house, if I were to make this zero energy building, then I would need to have 135 panels, but I still don't know where to place it. I'm, I still am doing um, a lot of design reforms in this building, and I did not like how it looked on these roofs. So I was planning on maybe putting it somewhere on the ground, um, but here's a small representation of how it's going to go if it's it, it is going to go on the roof. So there are 21 panels over here and the rest is gonna go somewhere in the ground. Um, the next design strategy would definitely be the entire area of the house. Uh, since we can see that the um, Airbnb is L-shaped, um, this um, helps it to have such a less area um, that it is easier to heat it. Uh, easier to heat and cool the house. And this can be an advantage, but also a very big disadvantage. Um, um, here are some um, smaller design strategies that I took, like the walls are insulated with seven layers, the giant windows that provide ventilation, the roofs in insulated with eight layers of insulation. Um, the windows used were triple glazed. The roof, the R value of the roof was equal or bigger than 50. Um, and that of the walls um, was found out to be 48, which is near to 50. Um, and the basement with the seven layers, like four layers installed. And that would be it. Thank you. Is there any question? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I have a few questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Okay, uh, can you go over the, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, the number 18, the, the slide number 18. So this is 18 and then the 19. Uh, so uh, what is this? So this is the final one. The number 19 is the, the final. Yeah. Okay, uh, no, I, I mean, uh, if you look at other projects, or I have been uh, looking at these uh, all the the projects that you have submitted, and there is something different in this project. I mean, this graphic. Usually, uh, all the students they have the highest consumption in January, February, and then November and December, and the consumption in summer is uh, less. Mm -hmm. But you have the other way around. Your peak of uh, consumption is in July. July, yeah. Uh, why is it? Uh, I think the explanation is on the slide number 17. Can you go back to the, yeah, here. Uh, because as you can see, you have a lot of uh, solar heat gains in mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good because you have solar heat gains in winter. So that's good. This is what we are looking for. You are saving energy in winter. But on the other hand, in summer, you have a lot of solar heat gains. Why? Uh, probably because, can you show me the, can you go up? I don't know what the slide is. Uh, yeah, the one with the windows, number 14. Yeah, this one. Uh, so you have used 0.18 and the solar heat gain coefficient is 0.55. Okay. Why do you have a solar heat gain coefficient of 3.7? Oh, I I actually changed it, but I don't know why it didn't came through, but um, all of those was supposed to be 0 0.55. I remember okay. you sent me the edited file. Yeah, I, I, I just don't know why it did not come through. I thought I changed it. Okay, so that might be the explanation because mm -hmm. uh, looking at other students, uh, and if you look at the, the energy consumption, number 19, the slide number 19, I think you have such a big number because mm -hmm. you're in the south elevation, the solar heat gain coefficient is three point something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so can you check it? Mm -hmm. I think I think this um I think I changed it and that's how I got this graph. I think this is just over here because I forgot to change it. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. 
it makes sense, but I don't know. I, I, I want you to confirm that you have sure. uh, used the sure. 0.5 in, in, if this is the right uh, graphic, mm -hmm. okay, if this is the right graphic, there might be another reason for having this peak in July mm -hmm. and not in January. I think it makes sense because if you look at the final view, the final slide, well, not the final, the, this, uh, the number 20, yeah. So here uh, we can see that you have a lot of uh, yeah. window area. Mm -hmm. So having a lot of window area in summer, uh, you have this uh, solar heat gains in summer. Uh, you told me that, or in the presentation, you said that you are not decided about using the louvers or not. You, you, you're, you haven't made that the final decision yet. I think I will be using louvers. I just don't know what are what is going to be the orientation and the type of louvers I want to use. Okay. Yeah. So you have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a week to, to decide that. I think you have tried something. What is this? element that you have uh, here at the bottom of your, no, the, the one at the bottom. Over here? Yeah, this what one? is this? Yeah, this is the yoga deck. And I was, I was kind of thinking about playing with some lights. Uh -huh. So it is just like a design. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and this, uh, I use the concept of the buffer space. So a buffer space is something that it's not uh, inside, it's not outside, it doesn't have a heating yeah. or a cooling system, uh, but it's not as cold as mm -hmm. it is the outdoor air or as hot as it is in summer. So that always work, okay? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I don't know if this is your final, I like the idea of having something different that it's not uh, probably, it's open because I don't see that there's an envelope, so it's open, but it's shady. So I think these kind of spaces can work, um, but it seems that it's not the final space yet. So you have to, is it the final or you're still? Uh... I think with the yoga deck, I'm, I'm kind of final with it. Okay, mm, I like it, but uh, if you could use this to mm -hmm. provide some shade to the rest of the windows, it would mm -hmm. be good. And probably if you are, if this is your final, if this yoga deck is your final design decision, maybe you can do something similar in the rest of the, of the large glass areas. Mm -hmm. Because having different, or having different uh, solutions in the same project is like, uh, Okay, I have louvers here, I have a deck there, I have a whatever here. So it's like, uh, probably if you have this and you repeat this decision in other places of the project, maybe it will work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Instead of yeah. having these louvers on the other side, if you have something like that, it can help you with it. Anyway, this is a design decision, but once you have to confirm uh, that uh, you have the right uh, electric loads. Sure. Uh, okay. And once you confirm, uh, then I will give you some, because the thing is that you have used the same solar uh, heat gain coefficient mm -hmm. in winter and in summer. This is something that uh, this Excel file is not perfect and you can mm -hmm. uh, change the solar heat gain coefficient in this graphic. Uh, okay, so I will give you another, confirm this, and then I will give you another tutorial on how to change the solar heat gain coefficient in winter and in summer, because now you have an excess of heating loads in summer. Yeah. Okay. Sure, thank I'll, I'll, you. Okay. Sure. But you are struggling, and this is what I like the most, that you are struggling with this, you are not done with the final design, mm -hmm. you're still thinking until the last moment. Uh, so this is what architecture is about. So we don't have the right answer at the beginning of the process. No, uh, we, have a, we have an answer at the end, and probably, or maybe it's not the right one, but at least it's the final yeah. answer, okay? So mm -hmm. the process is important. This is what I, this is what I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now,
uh, Rebecca. Yeah, I'm ready. You're ready. Okay. So let me. Okay, try to share the screen now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, my project is the Fisher House in Hatboro, Pennsylvania, and I am Rebecca Williams. Um, this is my table of contents. I'm going to be going through this, so I won't bore you with that. Um, this is my uh, floor plan, site plan. Um, it has a bunch of dimensions. Um, and this is how I got all my information. Um, this is just a picture of the inside of the house to represent two people. And I just put that there were nine rooms. This is the window selection I made. Um, light blue U value 0 0.21, triple glazing. Uh, this is my window and first floor elevations. Um, and then this is my window and second floor elevations. This is my roof analysis with um, option one, which was the softwood wrap rafter, and then option two, which is EPS. Um, and I added this uh, design up here to show uh, the four inches of EPS I added. Um, this is the thermal load of the roof, again, with the EPS and the rafters option. The U average is 0 0.75, uh, 1122 square feet, and 6080.03 BTU slash hour is the thermal load of the roof uh, before the analysis. So after the analysis, the U average is 0 0.021, uh, still the same square footage, and it went down to 1,696.46 for the thermal load. Um, this is my wall analysis before. Um, my U value was 0 0.031. My R value was 31.82. My wall analysis after, uh, my R value 55.82. My U value 0 0.018. Uh, this is the thermal load of the walls uh, <clears throat> before and after. So the before is 12,147.51. And then the after thermal loads is 6,295.17. The basement analysis before is 7,469.9. Um, as you can see, there's no insulation at all. And then after I put uh, four inches of EPS all the way down and it brought the thermal load to 3,927.4 BTU slash hour. Uh, this is the thermal load of the basement. Um, the before the analysis was 40,250. And then after the analysis, it was 19,950. So a significant difference. Uh, this is the thermal load through the windows. Um, I have all the sides here, northeast, southeast, southwest, west, east, south, and then the floor two, northwest, east, because there were not many windows on the second floor. This is my, um, the temperature chart uh, for July and then February, so winter and summer. These are my um, window, um, the monthly window charts. Um, and I am missing one down here that I forgot to put in, but I will add that. So this is my monthly demand. Uh, these are what I picked to be in the house or what I thought would be in the house. And uh, after going through all those, the total monthly demand consumption of the devices was 349.5 kilowatts per um, month. This is the summary of the um, improvements, the original state and then after the improvements. So it's a pretty significant difference. Um, the original state came out to be 58,803 and the after the improvements, it came out to be 29,127. This is my panel analysis. Um, I did 58 panels and I placed them on the roof um, because I had a flat roof and the maximum power 
per panel was 185 watts. Um, again, my monthly energy consumption, this shows uh, the AC energy and the total yearly um, consumption. This is the monthly energy consumption chart. Um, and it shows uh, where it fluctuates uh, in July, in June, July, August. Um, and then uh, the chart up here showing January through December. So this is the summary for 48 panels, uh, 100 by times 185 watts. And the DC system size I used was 9.1. The energy demand for this one was 33,064.65 and the total energy production was 13,096. And then this was the panel, or this was the summary with 58 panels and a total DC system size of 10.73. Um, again, the same energy demand, the total energy production was 44,184. Uh, this is a image of the original state. You can see the thermal load of the roof, 26,345, uh, thermal load of walls and the basement. And then I have a description or a picture or a description of the roof up here to show what was here before. And then after the improvements, uh, I forgot to mention in a different slide, the PV array production after the improvements was 12,035 kilowatts per hour. Um, and like I said before, I did flat PV panels across the roof um, because it just worked out the best in um, this project because again, it's a flat roof. Uh, the solar heat gains in the winter was 6,295 and the um, basement thermal loads were 3,924.4 after the analysis. That is all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Well, I, I understand that you have been struggling with this because architecture is not your major. So probably when we're focusing on the project and design decisions, and maybe this is something that sounds weird, uh, but I think you have uh, gotten the point of this course. I mean, you are not an architect, you are not in the design process, but I think now if you find a building and you want to analyze the, the performance of that building, uh, you can do it, okay? So you can calculate the uh, value of, uh, of details, you can calculate thermal loads uh, of windows, and then you can uh, calculate the, the size or the number of PV panels that we need to turn a building into a zero energy building. So that's the goal of the, and I think it's uh, it's perfect, okay? So what you have done is uh, what you need to know uh, to analyze existing buildings. Uh, you don't, you are not going to design buildings because architecture is not your, your major, but I think you can be a good uh, building scientist or uh, or you can analyze buildings, or you can work in a, uh, call it in a building commissioning firm, uh, just with the, with these skills that you 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 have gotten uh, with this course, and you have shown a good presentation, and you uh, you know what you are talking about, and you can understand, and I, I think you understand what you have done. Okay, so perfect. That's a uh, uh, for if there are students that are not in architecture, I think this is uh, what you should know after taking this course. You should be able to get a building, to analyze that building, and to offer a client with uh, uh, an analysis and how far you are from a zero energy building and what you should do to turn this into a zero energy building. It doesn't have to do with the design but it has to do with analyzing an existing building. So this is what you have done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so is there anyone else who wants to give a presentation? I don't think so. Um, I think it's good. I want to uh, thank the, the presenters today because you have uh, done something that is difficult. You have been the first, okay? So sometimes being the first in doing something 
uh, it's it's tough because you don't know what to do now uh, other students they have a reference they know what you have done and i think that would be good for for the the rest of your classmates <laughs>